This video will be part of a series of educational videos on artificial intelligence, which is going to evolve into the future digital superintelligence. Our understanding of human vision doesn't compare to how a computer sees things, but yet you know that today computers can recognize its environment. It can even recognize the relationships of objects in its environment over time. A real life example, a Tesla. The car can recognize both the objects around it and how it relates to the motion of the car and to each other. Would you like to learn how a dumb computer can do this? Stay right there to learn about this capability and its dangers. I'm on the platform odyssey.com and I'm now one of the top creators on there. In case I get the platform, please follow me there using the link in the description. My company provides privacy solutions like a Bytes VPN, Brax Mail, and now our newest product is the Brax 2 privacy phone which protects your data on mobile. Brax 2 is now available on Amazon and is also on my app, Brax Me. The links are in the description. If you showed a vision capable computer a photo of a dog and a cat, the computer does not actually know what a dog or cat is. Given the perceived sophistication of technologies like that found in a Tesla, you actually begin to overthink the capabilities of a computer. Whereas we automatically understand, as humans, what we are looking at when presented with a photo of a dog or a cat, a computer sees nothing but numbers. To compare two photos, it can look at the set of numbers in the two photos, and if they match, the photos are the same. Let's start this investigation by examining what's in a digital photo. To display a photo on screen, a photo rendering application has to assign color values to each pixel on the screen, and these pixel values are assigned an RGB value. This stands for the value of red, green, and blue. The exactness of how a color is represented in relation to what we see visually as humans is dependent on the size of the values allowed to represent the three values of R, G, and B. Old computers represented colors only in 8 bits with only 255 ranges per color. So red can be 0 to 255 and green is the same and blue is the same from 0 to 255. Newer devices that represent colors in 32 bits allow a range from 0 to over 4 billion. So red is from 0 to 4 billion, green is the same, and blue is the same. The more colors represented in a photo, the more data there is to analyze about what is being represented by the photo. While we as people automatically see the whole context of the photo instantaneously and without thinking, a computer only sees a big glob of numerical data in sets of RGB values. So for example, to recognize the face, one of the ways it can do that is to see if there are color ranges in the photo that would match the color of a human face. Now this is an oversimplification. Photos can contain, among other things, multiple faces. In order to understand better what's in a photo, the computer will attempt to see where the faces are and draw a rectangle around each so that it deals with a smaller chunk of the photo. This is basically like subdividing the big photo into smaller photos. The way it knows to split a photo into separate rectangular zones is to find the borders around the image of interest. So in the case of a face, it is able to find the edges where the face colors end abruptly and that defines the limit of a particular object. So a border for an object is nothing more than a color contrast. As it finds the areas where it is no longer close to the face color, then it marks that as the end of the zone. By doing this, it is able to demarcate the different objects in a photo. Now at this point, the computer does not yet understand anything about the object. I'm just suggesting here that if you ask the computer to identify faces by color using a known color range and using contrast to demarcate the regions, then you could likely make some sort of rudimentary guess that faces or skin is in the picture. Let's examine this color analysis of the picture first.
A good way of observing this concept in the digital world is to look at the features of a digital camera. There are two features in a modern digital camera that is key to understanding computer vision. First is the autofocus feature, and second is how the camera sees the distribution of colors and displays it as a histogram to the photographer. Autofocus works by looking at the edges of the image on the autofocus points. When an image is in focus, there is a higher contrast between the image and the background. The change in color is more abrupt. When not in focus, the change in color is more gradual. Numerically, this is represented by a greater difference in value between two points being compared in a focused point. While if the area is not focused, the color values tend to have more gradual changes. For example, as an extreme, black is represented as an RGB of zero, while white is an RGB of four billion for each color. This is the most extreme values of contrast using 32-bit color. So the greater the difference in value between two points, the more the contrast. In autofocus use, the camera seeks only to find the highest contrast it can get when using the autofocus controls. In a computer use, this same indication of contrast is the indication of an image border. The next feature of a digital camera that describes how the computer can see a photo is to look at a color histogram. In a camera, you can display a histogram of a photo after the photo is taken. The camera does this simplistically by averaging the entire photo. And this is how it displays the histogram of RGB values. In the computer, the photo does not have to be simplified. So you can imagine an RGB pattern that is continuous and may represent the entire area occupied by the bordered image. I'm only showing the histogram here to suggest to you that there is a color pattern to the image which corresponds to its shape and the distribution of colors. A computer does not see a circle, a square, or a face shape. It sees some RGB pattern as you see in the simplified histogram. Later on, it will handle the pattern recognition by something called a neural network. But showing you the histogram allows you to understand how an environment can be represented as input in a digital world. So to summarize, the computer needs to classify objects in smaller chunks by identifying a border for each object. And next, it needs to arrive at an object's digital pattern of RGB, which is then the input for pattern recognition. Now let me introduce you to the next part of the computer vision problem. The patterns of the colors captured by a computer represents only the current image. How does a computer judge that other images are similar, though they may not be exactly the same? It looks at the numerical representation of the image as a pattern, as I said. The computer then has to generalize that wave pattern into a more abstract representation of patterns. It may look for peaks and colors that are typical of the object being tracked, proportion of the color, presence of certain color sets. The way it finds patterns is based on the algorithms it is given to detect these mathematically. Some of these algorithms include acronyms like CNN, RNN, ANN, and so on, which are the actual processes used to make a determination and are called neural networks. We don't even need to know exactly how it does it. The patterns derived by the algorithms to classify objects are called characteristics. And the computer learns to decide that some object is close enough to the original because it finds a similar set of characteristics. To decide what is similar, a computer has to be fed many similar images so it can determine on its own if there is a sufficient evidence of a pattern that it can detect in the data provided. Later on, when presented with an image that potentially can match the known pattern, it responds with a probability value. And this final probability value is actually the sum of the probability values of each particular characteristic it has detected. Depending on the amount of machine learned patterns in this database, a computer may, for example, see multiple possibilities in what it thinks it sees, but it will select the object with the higher probability based on the closeness of the match. Now this is a very important point with computer vision. If you set up a machine learning software on a computer and try to do object recognition from scratch, 
you will find that you will have little success with accuracy. So let's consider how the more advanced AIs like that in Tesla or Google Vision or Amazon Deep Lens actually figure out what they're looking at. In order to recognize one object, the computer has to be trained to recognize that object. You give the software a photo and it needs a label so it can have a human interpretation of what the photo is. Let's look at a cat for example. The cat may be in different positions. There are different breeds of cats and there are different colored cats. But generally speaking, you will not find a green cat or a blue cat. So the patterns will be repeatable as long as the proper label is given to the photo. The computer has to be given a large amount of data and then its job is actually to determine for itself what is the similarity in this data set since the human has labeled them all as representing the same object. The process of teaching software about a photo using label learning is called machine learning. This requires human guidance. Humans feed the photos and the humans have to provide a label for objects identified in the photos. By the way, there's another approach which is more difficult but requires no humans and it is called deep learning. Here the computer finds the, the patterns on its own and then categorizes the patterns by itself. It may not necessarily know what to call the pattern but it will recognize those patterns if encountered again. This is used for a more advanced self-learning AI which we can discuss in the future. Machine learning is pretty tedious and may not lead to accurate data quickly. Going back to the cat example, a cat can be an infinite number of positions, infinite gradations of color, and also affected by changes in, in environmental lighting. Then the biggest issue is if you only have a partial image of a cat, how does a computer figure this out? The solution is to break out each object into identifying classifications. Look for the cat eyes, cat nose, cat ears, cat tail, cat fur, cat paws, cat legs, cat whiskers. Rather than look at the cat as one object, look at the object for subclassifications that are present. Thus, in real application, an object is recognized not just because of the overall pattern of the object, but the existence of subpatterns that are known to exist in these objects. This then allows for a higher level of accuracy and less data to confirm the detection of a cat versus having the computer learn all iterations of a cat, including partial visibility. Subclassifications increase accuracy with less data and are another level of label learning. Usable computer vision needs to happen fast. In a Tesla, the car has to see fast moving objects in its camera, quickly interpret what it sees, and then have the computer judge some action like move the steering wheel, hit the brakes, and so on. So it has to be able to analyze things quickly. In the case of Tesla, it does this by not trying to understand everything it sees in a photo, but only the limited objects that it is intended to understand that applies to driving the vehicle. Part of the solution is limiting the detection to only relevant objects. Tesla will not pay attention to two people fighting on the side of the road as long as they are not near the road. It will not care that there's a digger digging into the asphalt as long as the digger is bounded by orange safety markers and so on. The computer vision AI of a Google and Tesla is much more advanced. The analysis doesn't stop at the identification of objects but another layer of rules are overlaid over the results of the computer vision to come up with courses of action. This layer of analysis may just be a set of rules and not necessarily gathered from AI itself. In the case of Tesla, the situation posed by the detected objects allows the car to make a decision to change how the vehicle is driven. For example, a Tesla will stay in the center of the marked lanes because it can check frame by frame if the car is moving out of position. A more advanced machine learning is the ability to recognize a series of images as a temporal set or based on time. An example used in a Google video describing computer vision is the photo of someone packing a box. Without some sort of temporal concept, the AI would not necessarily know if the person is packing the box or unpacking the box. In this case, a series of images would have to be analyzed and the set of images considered together 
if there are less objects in the box at the end, then it is unpacking. If there are more objects in the box, then it is packing. Again, more contextual points can be taught to the machine as part of machine learning. In the case of a Tesla, the temporal relationships are considered at the beginning, though there are only a few limited set of scenarios it needs to worry about. Tesla can view multiple images in a sequence and actually understand the angles and speed of individual objects by a frame by frame comparison. So a temporal analysis is the basic part of the AI from the beginning. A Tesla does not view its environment in 3D. In fact, it turned off the radar capability. Tesla simply uses two dimensional AI and it is able to get a 3D understanding of the environment by motion and time or a temporal analysis of multiple frames. And that's how that AI is built. In the case of YouTube, Google Vision is used to analyze every single frame in an uploaded video. You will notice that it takes a few minutes to do a check on an uploaded video. This is the AI looking at the video frame by frame. Then it is able to look at the video for objects recognized. So layer one analysis is computer vision finding objects and text it recognizes in the video. Additionally, it does voice recognition to transcribe what's being said. Layer two analysis is to see if there are rules that YouTube wants to use to filter the video, like restrict advertising based on objects found in the video and the transcription. Between these two techniques, it is able to apply a quick content moderation check. For example, the identified objects could be a nude female and also the expression of the person or persons, happy, sad, scared, and so on. It is up to the second layer of analysis to determine if that's acceptable or not. So the next level of machine understanding is for humans to set rules for what it sees on the screen. For example, identification of the age range of the persons on the photo or video frame, expressions of the people in the photo or video frame, and this could be generalized to an emotional expression and perhaps a level of intensity suggested by the picture. This could be combined with clothing or lack thereof, perhaps other signs that could indicate weapons, violence, and so on. So humans have to decide what these rules are. And I imagine that this part of the analysis is just a layer of rules. And in the case of YouTube, it would be a content moderation rules base. These additional layers of rules applied to computer vision may come from human provided rules and not machine learned AI. Although the machine learning takes a lot of time to build into a database that can recognize objects, most of the object rules are integrated into the API or programming toolkit that are made publicly available by Google Vision or Amazon Deep Lens. In other words, you can rent their AI service in the cloud. So all you would have to do is pass images to Google Vision or Amazon Deep Lens and their API will be able to quickly analyze the image for you and give you a response as to what it has found. This makes it easy for any programmer to utilize computer vision without expending a lot of resources. The interesting aspect of cloud-based machine learning is that a low power computer could have the cloud-based servers of Google and Amazon power its computer vision capability. A simple app with access to the camera and the internet could periodically pass images to Google vision and then use the response to report a detected scenario. As an example, it could be possible for an app to detect a crime scene and have it reported to authorities. Interesting implications here, and this can be enabled with low-powered Raspberry Pis equipped with a camera or any smartphone, or it could be built into a Robocop. Developing machine learning is a massive task. According to Google, it will be practically impossible for a startup to train a new vision AI since it takes a huge amount of data and time to build the databases for the patterns and their matching labels. Currently, the players big on machine learning are Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Tesla. The real world is complex. Companies like Google feed the machine trillions of photos based on what everyone posts in social media and Google Drive and so on. In other words, the AI cannot function without your data. In a sense, this is a secondary use of your personal data beyond just the selling of ads. Google, Facebook, and Amazon are learning their environment based on the data 
you provide. You are powering the AI of the future. This is an interesting side note I'd like to mention. The potential future AI and what it knows about you personally is based on the amount of data it has about you. So if some AI is going to make a decision in the future to judge you personally, it will have less success if it doesn't have the chance to do machine learning or deep learning about your data. One of the limitations of AI is the understanding of context. Although recognition of objects is now quite doable, at least with common objects, what takes time is the understanding of the context and the application of that info as normal thought to us human beings. AI is used to judge whether videos are not following community guidelines and are thus subject to moderation. It is used to track what people say in social media and in videos so that certain videos can be banned. But mostly these are based on human provided rules and not necessarily AI. In order for it to self judge, a computer will have to be taught a lot of scenarios and then the computer would have to learn how to make judgments. Absent that, the computer is typically given a rule set and that is often the way content moderation and censorship is applied in social media. Because of the limitations of a rule-based approach, often the results of the automated content moderation have to be reviewed by humans. In the future, given enough variations and interactions, a computer can learn to judge for itself. And this is where the danger lies. A human has to teach the computer to judge. There is no human that thinks exactly the same way as another. So think about the implications of this. Machine learning guided by a biased entity or person with an agenda. A scary thought. Think about complex ethical issues. Who's going to teach the computer what is right or wrong? Profit-minded companies, of course, have the incentive to teach the AI things that benefit the corporation. After all, it is their resources being used to build this machine learning. And the common person isn't going to know what the computer is being taught. In its baby stage, we see the application of content moderation in automated algorithms as we see discussed in the press between Elon Musk and Twitter executives. In many cases, we will never see this discussed and AI will be used in ways and in a speed that cannot be countered by any other entity that has no access to controlling the AI. In conclusion, computer vision is just one of the tools used to provide the base data for more advanced applications of AI. There are other sources of raw data aside from computer vision, such as voice recognition and character recognition. But these providers of raw data then are used in more advanced layers of AI to provide a framework for more advanced decision making. As I mentioned, this will be part of a series to introduce you to the AI and its threats and its evolution into digital super intelligence. Please subscribe so you can be alerted to future related videos. Thank you for watching.